All right, so in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, energetics at the macro level, how organisms obtain energy, how they use energy, and how they try and store it if they obtain enough. So let's talk just about the basics of energy flow. We're going to talk about this much more in the ecology unit, but um, all organisms must obtain energy from their environment. For most ecosystems, that's going to come from the sun um, 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 hitting producers who are able to take in that light energy through photosynthesis and convert it to the stored energy of chemicals like glucose. Um, I'm probably going to refer to it kind of more generically as just biomass energy because uh, carbohydrates and fats can all kind of store energy and chemical bonds. Those high energy electrons can be liberated in the process of cellular respiration when needed. Um, so we'll just kind of refer to it generically as biomass that organisms are putting on as they obtain energy. Obviously, consumers can obtain energy from producers or from other consumers, and perhaps decomposers can kind of make use of the, the biomass of dead organisms. So organisms can obtain their energy, but they're constantly spending it as well. And whenever they transform um, the energy of biomass into the energy of ATP, they're also releasing heat energy that sort of can't be recuperated. And so we just try to emphasize kind of a one-way flow of energy in ecosystems. And that's why organisms constantly need to obtain more energy. So um, if organisms are capable of taking in more energy than they need to spend, then they can store biomass. And so we just want to get across in this new curriculum the idea that organisms put on biomass um, or sort of build up their bodies if they're, they're taking in more energy than they spend. And so certainly for producer organisms like plants, they're certainly hoping to do this overall during the day. They should be doing much more photosynthesis than respiration. And perhaps they're making lots of extra sugar that they're storing. Uh, remember that a lot of plants will store their, their energy, um, their, their carbohydrates in the form of starch. Uh, because of course at night they can't do any photosynthesis anymore. Without light, they're not energizing electrons. Um, but of course, respiration is, is always needed in order to make ATP to keep cells running. So um, they're going to have to take some of, some of that biomass out of storage and cut it up um, and spend it in respiration. So they're sort of storing biomass perhaps during the day and they're spending it a little bit at night. And of course, for plants that may say lose their leaves um, during uh, the winter time, um, hopefully they've also done plenty of photosynthesis during the spring and summer months to store enough energy to be able to produce new leaves and survive the winter. So um, plants are capable of storing biomass and of course animals are too. Um, if animals sort of um, take in more than they're spending, they might put on fat. Um, uh, fat is kind of a good long-term way of storing energy. There are sort of um, entire cells dedicated to storing fat in animals' bodies. Um, sugars can also be stored as glycogen before they're turned into fat. Um, glycogen is kind of a good intermediate term storage. Um, most of glycogen is stored in the liver, as we're going to see in the next unit. And also your muscles want their own supply of glycogen so that they have um, guaranteed access to biomass energy whenever they need to spend it in order to contract. Okay, so let's just kind of um, talk through, we've talked through about the idea that organisms can, can um, store biomass and that they lose biomass um, if they spend more than they take in. Um, when you're losing weight, it's because you're sort of spending more calories than you're taking in. And so literally what was formerly mass in your body is literally leaving you as carbon dioxide and water and the energy is leaving as heat um, when you're losing weight. So let's just kind of talk a little bit about how all organisms spend energy. And then I just want to go through a little bit of a list of, of sort of some things that we'll see in the future that will incur ATP expense. It might seem like this um, really rapid fire list. Um, and I don't want you for the purposes of this video to feel like you have to memorize everything I'm about to show at you. Um, I just want to introduce it and then, and then we'll see later that we're going to talk about it in more detail. Hello, fruit fly. Okay, so all organisms spend energy doing three basic things. Uh, growth, reproduction, and maintaining homeostasis. So let's kind of go into that a little bit. 
Um, if uh, all organisms have to grow, um, even if you're a little single-celled bacterium, perhaps you're born by the process of cell division. Um, but you know, cell division is going to necessarily make two little cells out of one original one. So maybe those cells have to uh, expand a little bit. Maybe they have to build some proteins um, and sort of expand the size of their cell. Um, most multicellular organisms are not going to make their cells too much bigger, though. They're going to become larger by making more cells. And we'll see that that's going to be a process called mitosis um, very soon. Um, and certainly growth might involve um, building proteins is very energy expensive, as we'll see in, in genetics. And certainly copying all of the DNA to make a new cell is going to be pretty um, energy intensive as well. Reproduction will involve other things, um, perhaps other types of cell division um, will eventually differentiate between these types of cell divisions, but all cell divisions are going to require making new DNA, lining up that DNA and splitting it evenly, which all takes energy. And then, of course, if you're um, thinking about sexual reproduction in a population, maybe there's some competition among members of the population, um, and maybe there are sort of courtship displays or um, competitions between males that have to be won, and that might involve a lot of energy expense as well. Okay, um, so what about maintaining homeostasis? There's sort of, you know, a, a lot of things we could talk about here, and I'll just kind of throw a few things at you. Uh, maybe at the cellular level, active transport is going to be really important in terms of maintaining the right imbalance of chemicals inside and outside the cell. Uh, building proteins, repairing DNA might involve kind of basic um, maintenance functions. Um, and at the organismal level, all kinds of things are, are constantly going on in your body to make sure that you're maintaining the right conditions. Conditions like not too acidic, not too basic, the right temperature in your body, the right level of salt and water in your body, the right level of sugar in your body. Some of these we'll discuss in more detail. You know, for animals, I would argue that muscle contraction kind of falls under maintaining homeostasis, maybe to get away from predators or to, um, you know, um, find food or attack prey um, could be important. So these are all kind of um, homeostatic mechanisms. And I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, just a few broad strategies that, that many organisms have evolved in order to conserve energy. Um, so let me start with the micro level. We've already talked about this concept, um, but the concept of, of um, regulating metabolic pathways within cells. Um, oftentimes, the, the metabolic pathway is regulated by the end product, so you sort of shut off pathways when they've already produced what they're set up to produce. So we can um, prevent maybe um, metabolic pathways from spending ATP when it's not needed. We're going to soon see in molecular genetics that, that not only is it important to regulate existing proteins, but maybe we also want to uh, regulate the expression of genes. Maybe we want to turn off certain genes when those proteins are no longer needed or not needed at, at, at one particular time, um, and maybe turn genes on when those proteins are really important. And we're going to see that that's a really important aspect of, of our conversation in molecular genetics. Okay, uh, maybe in terms of, of reproduction, this is kind of the more macro level adaptations now. Um, many organisms might only reproduce at certain times. Um, and so they're not constantly trying to reproduce. They're not dedicating all of their energy towards successful reproduction. Um, maybe it's kind of a seasonal thing like flowering plants that only make their flowers at certain times of the year. Or animals that, that only um, you know, um, have the reproductive instincts um, at certain times of the year as well. Um, so maybe that saves energy for all the other times um, when you're not trying to make pollen, when you're not trying to make a flowery organ with a scent and, and filling it with sugar, that kind of thing. Okay, um, maybe the idea of growing first is, is um, so organisms often have um, um, sort of the, the, the set up to focus on growth before sexual maturation and, and attempts at reproduction. So this is like a really young sapling. You know, it's probably not going to make cones until it kind of grows to a certain size and kind of establishes itself and, and, and has enough biomass to be able to dedicate towards reproduction. Um, and so, you know, there are kind of those mechanisms too. Um, this might really be different from species to species. There are often some prey species that, that mature sexually very quickly um, because they might die very quickly. And so sort of their evolutionary incentive is to, is to mature quickly and reproduce pretty fast. So there are kind of several um, things at play when considering that adaptation. 
And then I just want to throw the idea that many organisms kind of have interesting um, alternate metabolic states. Uh, they might sort of have an active mode and then a very inactive mode overall. Obviously, they're still alive when they're kind of looking like they're very inactive. Um, but maybe their, their overall many metabolic pathways are acting very differently inside many of their cells. So the classic example are our winter animals hibernating at, at the very um, difficult to survive times in the winter. Maybe just by sort of um, activating um, only necessary metabolic pathways, they actually spend a lot less energy surviving those very tough winter conditions than they would if they were in a very active state. Um, as it turns out, um, many students are less familiar with the concept of summer torpor for many desert animals. Again, maybe many um, summer conditions are very difficult to survive, so they actually go into a low active state called estivation. Um, other examples include bacteria. Many bacterial species will form this um, kind of um, collapsed structure within their cell that's very metabolically inactive, um, called an endospore, whenever they sort of sense that conditions are getting dangerous and tough to survive around them. Um, you can also think of seeds um, in many plant species that maybe um, stay in that dormant state and don't germinate until they sense that the conditions around them are such that they might be able to successfully grow. Um, so they're sort of staying in a, in a very low energy um, spending state so that maybe they can kind of wait out conditions longer. So those are all kind of ways of, of conserving energy. And I just want to finish this video's conversation with one quick conversation in chapter 40. Just two very different ways that some animal, land animal species, kind of regulate their body temperature with different strategies. I want to talk about endothermy and ectothermy. Um, your endotherms are for the most part mammals and birds, or at least as far as I'm aware, all mammals and birds are endotherms. Um, most reptiles, and I think all amphibians, are ectotherms. Um, there are some exceptions here and there, but those are those are kind of you know broad distinctions that we can make. It's a little tougher when you talk about insects and when you talk about um, some other groups. Um, but we'll just focus on these guys and just kind of give a, a basic um, definition here. Um, ectotherms are capable of regulating their body temperature. Sometimes students tell me that ectotherms can't regulate their, their body temperature. Um, they don't do so internally, but they can still use their outside um, environment and their behavior to control their body temperature. So don't tell me that a frog can't cool down. Um, sure, it can't cool down internally, but it can go jump into a pool or it can go into the shade and cool down. Um, if it's getting too cool, it might go back into the sun and kind of bask um, and that will warm it up. So it can definitely still control its body temperature, but it's just doing so with external help and its behavior. And by the way, we endotherms can do that too. Please don't tell me that I have to suffer being hot. Um, I can go into the shade too and cool down. But we also have internal mechanisms to control our body temperature. Um, your book will describe several such mechanisms. You're, you're welcome to keep it simple for my purposes and just think about you know, typical sweating, releasing water, or having water evaporate to take heat away from the body. Obviously, dogs can't sweat very well with the fur all over their body, um, but they can still pant and release that water vapor. We can release the water vapor more broadly on our skin. Um, we can shiver as well, uh, contracting the muscles in order to spend some ATP and generate some heat. So we're just using internal mechanisms to control our temperature. And if there was one clear-cut successful strategy, then you might imagine that we'd only see those types of organisms in, in modern biology. Um, but the fact that we see so many of both types leads us to believe that there are sort of major advantages for both. And so let's kind of just um, finish up this uh, video by talking about that. Um, for endotherms, they might be able to um, live in places that, that you won't find ectotherms. So sort of a, a broader expanse, although certainly no one species can live anywhere. Um, but you can have species um, that live, say, in the cold taigas, like um, uh, wolves, some certain species of wolves, and maybe like owls of, of certain types, um, or what you think of when you think of a snowy forest, um, you don't think of, say, snakes, right? Um, 
Endotherms can also sustain um, intense activity. So, so maybe because they can keep their body warm enough, they can um, um, do things like fly, like run um, for long distances or run very fast. Um, reptiles are typically more sluggish, especially in the morning when they're, and they kind of have to warm up in order to be active. And they might depend more on kind of like quick strikes rather than you know, running after their prey um, for miles and miles and miles. Okay, but ectotherms do have the major advantage of having an overall metabolic state that requires a lot less calories to support them. So um, they don't have to find food and, and eat nearly as much food per gram of body weight as an endotherm does. Um, think of your typical endotherms, you know, birds um, constantly pecking, um, looking for food. Um, think of any mammals you might have had as pets that you definitely have to feed every day um, versus some of my colleagues here at, at Milton who have snakes, um, large snakes that they might feed once every two weeks, once every three weeks um, because they are just uh, require far fewer calories. So there are advantages to both and we see um, organisms thriving with both strategies. So all we tried to do in this video is talk a little bit about energy, not just at the cellular level, like with um, the previous chapters of this unit, but kind of talk about it a little bit more broadly, how organisms obtain energy, the fact that they can store energy for the long term, um, um, some adaptations all organisms or many organisms have for conserving energy, and a little bit about ectothermy and endothermy.